Wren ran his fingers over the picture on the cover, moved closer to the light, opened the book, and began to read. It's important for women's voices to be heard because it's important for everybody's voices to be heard. As he entered the story, hemlocks and pine trees soared overhead. A lake spread out before him like a mirror reflecting the sky, and the sound of a rifle shot boomed in his ears. I mean, my image for it always is a campfire because we have been sitting around them for 100,000 years telling our stories. When I stopped trying to verify the facts and started using them to open my imagination, my story began to circle in on motherhood and on all the terrible things a mother and child can do to each other. And in that very unconscious preoccupation, which I would have put a halt to had I become aware of it, the novel was about me. When you understand that storytellers shape our culture, they shape who we are as individuals, as a people, then who gets to be the storyteller becomes a really pivotal question. Her words were lightning and I was a kite in the storm electrified. Then and there I joined the fight with everything I have. You see, I am a free woman, daughter of a free people. I can stand straighter and speak bolder because I know that we have it within ourselves to be free on our own terms. The goal, I think, is balance. So for powerful groups, it's progress to listen. For less powerful ones, it's progress to speak. More voices are better than fewer voices, which is why a place like Hedgebrook is so important, because it adds voices to the conversation. Here's the thing about being a girl and wanting to play outside. All the grown-ups grind it into you from the get-go. Girls outside aren't safe. You know, people ask me, was it a vision? Was it a dream? No, it wasn't. When I looked for the land, I was in a time of change. Change was coming and I wanted to be anchored with a new place. It appealed to me because it had everything on it that I had wanted on a piece of land. It had pastures, trees, old buildings. So it was perfect for feeling at home. There's an old dairy farm on Whidbey Island in Washington State. The property looks out on Puget Sound and on a shallow inlet called Useless Bay. It's a beautiful place filled with meadows and forests streams, and wildlife. In 1985, Seattle philanthropist Nancy Nordoff bought the property and almost immediately felt overwhelmed. It was too much for me. The land was too large, it was too much to be done, but it was a place that really cried out to be uh, used. So the question was what to do? And the answer came, women writers, women's voices how to support it, and how to allow women to really feel strong, stronger. The original plan was simple. Six cozy cottages and lots of time and space to write. I think building the cottages was to me a real privilege. I remember one day counting the number of people working on the cottages, there were over 25, and I just, the energy uh, of that experience was very meaningful. In the summer of 1988, Hedgebrook welcomed its first six writers, and in the 25 years since then, almost 1,500 others have followed. I would go to the ferry and meet them, drive the car up to the cottage, let them walk in first, and the, the tears inevitably followed. Many would say, this is for me. You made this for me, I can live here. Residencies are two to six weeks, and women do not pay to come to Hedgebrook. It's always been part of the ethos that um, residencies are fully funded, so that's not anything anybody has to worry about when they come here. The 
intention of diversity was in all ways. Didn't have to be a published writer, you could be a beginner. Geography was important, age was important, and culture was important. Um, everything that you can think about that brings richness to a group of people. Tell someone you're going into the woods alone, and they'll story your head with trailside cougar attacks, cave-dwelling misogynists, lightning strikes, forest fires, flash floods, and psychopaths with a sick sense for a woman alone in a tent. I really think about my life as a writer as pre-Hedgebrook and post-Hedgebrook. I was working in publishing. I'd kind of reached a crossroads where I really had to make the commitment. Well, was I going to work on the business side of publishing, or was I going to embrace my true love, which was actually being the writer? On a whim, I'd, I'd heard about Hedgebrook. I applied, and when I got in, I saw it as a sign. So I quit my job and broke up with my boyfriend and got on a plane and flew across the country, you know, sublet my apartment. And uh, it was April Fool's Day, and I was sitting there waiting for someone to pick me up, and I was like, oh God, what have I done? Um, when I came to Hedgebrook, I had written my first screenplay, and it was really awful. And I had gotten feedback from people that said, you should keep working. And I didn't really know where or how to get started, but I had the opportunity to come to Hedgebrook for a week. And I came here with 120 pages of bad screenplay. I was at a dark place in my own project. I had literal and figurative piles of information that I had gathered over the years that was supposed to be a book and was six months late to the publisher. And uh, I arrived in a bit of a shame spiral at Hedgebrook. The first time I went, I almost didn't go because in three months, I think I'd been home for five days and I'd been on 25 flights. And then I found out that my mother um, was ill and was passing. And so by the time I got to Hedgebrook, I walked into the kitchen and I looked out the window and there was the smell of chocolate chip cookies and they were there to take care of me and I didn't know how much I needed that. First time I came, I was just working on some poems. Came here and did it and it was just, the, the space was, I, I needed a space and the space was kind to me and everybody was kind to me and it was just, you know, I was taking care of family, I was taking care of children, I was taking care of, of my mother, and, um, and not, you know, being myself, but not being on my path. Um, and when you're at Hedgebrook, they say, you can be on your path, and we're here with cookies. <laughs> I wanted Hedgebrook to be family-like, friendly, warm, welcoming. This is where we want you to come so you can do your work. I started using the phrase radical hospitality to describe what happens here because um, I felt like we needed a way to talk about the transformative experience that women writers have when they're nurtured in this way. You know, from the moment that they pick you up at the ferry to the moment that you leave, you are taken care of in every single way that's possible. And that's feeding your soul, it's feeding your stomach, it's feeding your heart, and it's feeding your writing. That's what allows us to do the work that we do here. All they have to do while they're here is be a writer. They don't have to be a mother or a daughter or a sister or a caretaker in any way. They are purely here to do their work, and that is such a rare experience for women who are so used to nurturing others. This kind of hospitality, this kind of supporting these women in a certain way that they've never been supported before, giving them the confidence and strengthening their voices, which is what Nancy wanted them to do in the first place, the sort of purpose of Hedgebrook, it is revolutionary. It is a political act. Everything you ever paid for, you ever worked on, you ever received, everything you ever gave away, you ever held on to, you ever forgot about, Every single thing is one of every single thing, and all things are gone. There is water everywhere, and there is nothing clean to drink. 
What goes on there is deceptively sharp and revolutionary. It isn't a soft and fuzzy place. It's a, it's a very tough place where people do hard work and come up with um, results. No, it's great doing the work. The challenge is like when you're in that cabin by yourself and there's no diversion and you meet yourself. And that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's always good ultimately. But at night when it's just you in a cabin, no TV, none of that stuff, there's no diversion. You meet you. All of a sudden, the cobwebs and the shame and the whatever stumbling blocks you have just start to fall away. And for me, I actually created a book out of years of material and what felt like an unimaginable mess. The peace, the quiet, the confidence that someone had in giving me the time and space to think about my work, it all sort of fueled me. And I left with 85 pages and a real strong sense of where it was all going to go. I walk into the wilderness alone because the animal in me needs to fill her nose with the scent of stone and lichen, ocean salt and pine forest warming in early sun. I walk into the wilderness alone so I can hear myself, so I can feel real to myself. My day at Hedgebrook begins with waking up, usually with the sunlight. I come down, start my coffee, I eat my breakfast that I've packed the night before and brought in a little basket. And I usually make a fire to warm up the cottage. Hedgebrook is the first place where I learned how to build a fire. <laughs> we looked at uh, electric, of course, and also at gas, but I, I chose the wood. It has been a struggle for some, but that's a good struggle. It does feel great to feed the fire, you know, which is both warms your house and feed the fire intellectually. I feel I go out for a walk and I see all the clouds of smoke from each of the cottages and you know that people are in there working and it makes you get excited about doing your work too. The farmhouse is pretty important to the life of the women who are in their cottages as they come here for dinner every night and form uh, a community of women. At 5.30 you get to go to dinner and, and that's really the only requirement that they have at Hedgebrook. You don't have to write. You can spend all day at the beach if you want to. You can walk in the woods, you can find another writer, you can have amazing conversations in front of a brook. But you have to come to dinner, and at 5.30, everybody shows up, and you get to share your day. You were in the thunderstorm when oh, so was it and there's hail, hail on you. It hurts. The whole night. Was that hail? And that's a wonderful thing to do, especially after a day of solitude, to talk to the other women and see what their days have been like. Has there been, you know, some great aha moment for them? And I've got all these pictures on the desk of me as a kid. My mother is a young woman, oh, middle aged woman. And it's kind of like going to the past, aren't we? If someone's really struggling with something, we get the chance to interact and maybe help each other or give each other some suggestions to maybe move them past that obstacle in their work. What's been happening in the cabin is that I have, the, the life has taken on a slowness and mm -hmm. so has the melancholy. Like it's just... That sort of requirement that you be in the presence of each other and that you give something of yourself is fundamental to what Hedgebrook is about that it's about being a community of women who write, not being a place where you come to be alone and isolated. It's the community that makes Hedgebrook unique, I think, especially for any group that has been marginalized. You need a time of being central. And that is the crucial element of any profound personal change or political change. Dinner's ready. <laughs> The meals at Hedgebrook are memorable. It's some of the best food I've ever had, period. First there's a cream of mushroom soup, and then I made a oh braised my. lamb and red wine and rosemary, mm, yes. and then a sweet potato shepherd's pie with some goat cheddar cheese. Oh, 
because the garden is between the cottages and the farmhouse and so much of what we eat actually is grown there, you have a more intense appreciation for the organic nature of it, for the fresh nature of it. There is such care and attention that goes into preparing food that will work for every woman who's here. The, the best part is they ask you for your comfort foods. And at some point, they'll do their best to actually deliver the thing that you said gives you the most joy. In the kitchen, they're artists. How they use their imaginations to extend love, to extend beauty, and say, okay, you take this and you go back and you create. We created this so you can create. That's what they do. They're magicians. They're artists. To the chef. Cheers. 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 Mm. Oh, this is amazing. Oh my goodness. It is so good. It's really about that community where the cook and every single person at the table are all equal and are all loving the space and, and talking about what they did that day. There's things that I've told people here that I've never told a soul. And I know it's going to stay exactly where it is. We may never lay eyes on each other again, but they, they, these, these, these women become your sisters. <laughs> There is a kind of safety in terms of the way that you're cared for there, you know, that will allow you to write dangerously. My mother drinks herself into her regular weekend stupor, and as usual, she demands that I do the dances that the kids are doing now. I refuse. I make a point of being as nasty as possible. After dinner, often, there's a library right next door where we can go and do some readings if we want to. And sometimes it's just like five minutes or ten minutes of what someone's working on and to, to get people's feedback and people's support and people's ideas. That night after her friends leave, I am beaten. I do not cry. I say to her, hit harder. She looks at me in disbelief. I never said that before. She breaks down and cries as if she were the one that was beaten. The first night of that is the most scary thing ever, right? It's that I, I've been writing and I go and I eat and I share conversation and isn't that wonderful? And then someone says, yeah, let's share some writing. Dear John, I finally got me up the nerve to go out today. It was hard. You are like, oh, I actually have to put the thing I've been working on out in the world, which is where it wants to live in the end anyway, but we're just so sort of protective of that moment. And then you, you share and you get really positive feedback, if for nothing else than that you actually face the empty page today and put something on it. Mm -hmm. Because whatever else is going on is informing her honesty. Do you know what I'm saying? That is an experience I'd never had before. It's very helpful, first of all, just to read something out loud, even with no one there. But to read to a trusted group that you know is trying to help you be yourself, not someone else, was new to me and very helpful. Part of any on-the-road saga is love and romance along the way. I realize I've been a disappointment in that regard, <laughs> partly because I grew up in an era of enough danger and power difference between women and men to make trust a requisite for any love affair. Sometimes people really get what you're doing and sometimes they just get that you're doing it. And both of those things are equally valuable in the creative process. At Hedgebrook, there's a ritual of gathering our breakfast for the following morning. And the Hedgebrook kitchen provides us with fresh milk, fresh eggs, yogurt, oatmeal, and we fill these wicker baskets that they provide for us. Oh, my flashlight's underneath all my stuff. That's fine. Aha! Ta-da! We call Hedgebrook both a noun and a verb. The noun is the retreat and the residency experience, the mothership. The verb is how Hedgebrook lives in the world. And we've been working with our alums all over the world to host salons and gatherings and events where they can come together in community. There's even a place in Brooklyn, alumni Holly Morris and Sharon Lerner have come together and founded Powder Keg, which is an urban retreat in Brooklyn that's very much inspired by Hedgebrook. They even have a cookie jar that's never empty. Powder Keg has really been inspired by the ethos and values of Hedgebrook because 
they work, they're transformative, they're revolutionary, all these things. Uh, while they're incredible when you're out in the woods, they also work in an urban setting. We have a group of women writers who all work together. We don't really cook here, we do order in a lot, and uh, we don't have the birds and the sounds of nature that Hedgebrook offers, but we have Flatbush Avenue in New York City as our white noise. I've been having trouble sleeping, scrolling through my social media feeds, learning things that don't mean anything to me. What is the worth of a word? The measure of its value? I want to know your dreams. This idea of Hedge Brooklyn, um, which came from Powder Keg, has really taken off and taken Hedgebrook off of the West Coast and, and started to spread it over to the East Coast and across the country. Wherever we are, we're concerned about Hedgebrook, and so I think each of us can be a bridge to Hedgebrook, both for people to travel to it and for ideas to travel from it. Just like me, you dial his number and watch him from across the street see your name pop up on the screen and ignore you to voicemail. <laughs> Just like me, you are destined for greatness. Just like me, you watch greatness cower in the smallness of you here, now. Just like me, you wish you were just like her. I see in the future that more and more work by women is going to come out into the world and that we can start to be a model for other women like Nancy Nordoff who want to found places like this to support women and give them space and time to do their work. When I first heard about Nancy Nordoff, it was because she was on a list of people who gave money to good political candidates. And that's why I called her. We didn't know each other. Neither she or I are sure what her question was, but she asked me to, to give money to something. And I didn't know Gloria Steinem. And good fortune for me that I said, I'd be happy to if you would come to Hedgebrook. Now that's a pretty ballsy response to Gloria Steinem. This was an insane bargain since it's win-win, you know. And I did what I said I would do. She came and has been coming for eight to ten years over a span of time to write her memoir. You know, I decided to become a member of the advisory board just because I thought that Hedgebrook was too secret. It had its light under too much of a bushel, so I think now the task is to, as Eleanor Roosevelt always said, widen the circle. Hello. What I think is so extraordinary about Nancy Nordoff is that she was seeking home and she chose instead to create a home for other women to come and to do their work because she felt like it's important for the world to hear from women. You know, everybody, I meet who knows her says, oh, that's who I want to be. I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> you know, forget superheroes. I want to be Nancy Nordoff. I'm a person who's been in the not-for-profit world most of my life. So great ideas, most of them are put on the shelf and never get off the shelf. Well, this was one that went into action. And that, to me, has really been the best accomplishment of my life, outside of the three children I gave birth to. I don't think there's really any other place like Hedgebrook. And it produces a fantastic amount of pro-woman work and transforms lives. I think the thing that's so magical for me is that when I'm here at Hedgebrook, I know that my voice matters. Writing at Hedgebrook wasn't really just about the number of pages that I produced, and I did write so much while I was there. But more importantly, it was the unexpected themes that came up because of the setting, because of my fellow writers. I think that that really, for me, is, is the most important thing. This place is food. You know, it's mental, emotional food. It's, it's soul food, it really, in a true sense of the word. You know, meet you. 
come, come here and meet you. You know, even people who've been to many residencies, all of which have their strengths, Hedgebrook is different. It's the full Monty for women writers. <laughs> I'll see you guys tomorrow. Anytime soon. Yes, yes, we will. Yes, yes, yes. Bye. Okay. The girl who goes alone says with her body, the world is worth the risk. Thank you.